Let's pray before we look into the word of God. The words of that last song were so appropriate and I think so moving for the times that we live in that uh, it's easy for us to lose focus, to uh, look to the wrong places for hope. And uh, <clears throat> that song reminded us, as we're going to look at in the scripture today, there's only one place to turn with our fears. There's only one place to expect refuge and strength. That's in the person of our great, mighty God. Father, we come to your word this morning asking you to speak to our hearts, to quiet them when they are restless and fearful, to convict when we have wandered away from what we ought to be focused on. And Father, just to draw us close to yourself as a heavenly father who so lovingly cares for his children. For a shepherd named Jesus who leads his sheep. Father, our world offers us much to fear. But we're reminded that you're in control of this world. You created it. You're superintending it, and someday you're going to destroy what we know and restore the way things ought to be. So give us wisdom as we look into the scriptures today, and may the Spirit of God take the Word of God and apply it to hearts of the people of God. For your glory we pray. Amen. Amen. Last week, if you were here, we went into an excursion of Psalm 46, which tells us that God is our refuge and our strength and a present help in time of trouble. The psalmist knew that times of trouble were coming, and he was telling the people that there was one place for them to turn and to run and that God would be the refuge for catastrophes. He would be the strength to get them through the long, enduring trials that come in life. And then he emphasized that God wasn't just a God of the past, but God is a God of the present. In the very moment that you're going through difficulties, you are not walking through those difficulties alone. You are walking there in the very presence of God even through the valley of the shadow of death. The psalmist tells us, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. So in our last and final journey from this life to the next, God is present as we walk through that experience. Today I'd like to turn our minds now from just the general running to a place of refuge and strength, a present help in time of trouble, to how that really looks in a specific way from the Word of God. And we're going to bounce around and see different kinds of illustrations. It's common in our day, I don't know if you've seen a lot of these, but I've seen a fair number of stickers on the back of truck and car windows that say, no fear. Nice, nice dream thought. No fear. If the person driving that car is honest, probably within the last hour of that drive or some other activity, they've run into some situation that causes them fear. It's true of all of our lives. Even those who, of us who have uh, come to know God and we've known him for many years and we've walked a long journey, we're facing trials and difficulties that bring uncertainty and a disquieting feeling to our heart. That's common in Scripture. 
So where do we run for refuge? In the Bible, we discover different types of fear. I think sometimes we get a little cloudy on what fear is, and we think that all fear is inherently sinful, and that God is somehow calling us into a relationship of fearlessness. That's not true at all. God doesn't call us to be fearless. He calls us to be persons who fear the one person who alone is worthy of our fear and our trust. Because on the other side of that, we find his covenant promises fulfilled in our lives. Think of Adam. He sinned. What did he do? Run to God in repentance, bow down and say, forgive me? No, he tried to run and hide from God with Eve. What a foolish thing if we really have a theology that God knows all things. What bush, what tree, what wall, what room are you going to pick to hide in from a God who sees and knows all? What a foolhardy way of dealing with our fear. Adam knew what he had done was wrong. He was convicted in his conscience. He knew that he had sinned. And then we come to Cain. Cain was scared to death because he killed his brother. And he was worried that somebody was going to kill him. And then there's Jacob. Jacob and Rebecca. We'll talk about this a little bit later on, but Jacob was so afraid that um, somebody was going to fall in love with his beautiful wife and kill him that he lied and told everybody that she was his sister. Learned that from his father who pulled the same trick in Egypt when the people loved his beautiful wife, Sarah. Moses was afraid to lead. He said, God, I can't lead these people. How is uh, Pharaoh going to know who I am, what authority I have? I'm slow to speak. I'm, I'm uh, tongue-tied. I have all kinds of impediments. Pick somebody else. Afraid to do his job. Afraid to lead. Afraid to do what God had called and specifically asked him to do. Saul. The king, afraid of David's popularity. Peter, a man who denies his savior three times around the campfire because a little girl said, you're one of them. And he was afraid. And it led him to deny his savior three times. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 about his fears and tells Timothy to rekindle the gift that God had given. Timothy was afraid of persecution. Timothy was afraid of taking a stand. Timothy was just backward in his experience of being a leader as a Christian. Paul says, Timothy, stir up the gift that God has given you and use it to God's glory. The Bible uses the terms for fear in different ways. The Bible uses the term in Hebrews 13, 6, says, so that we confidently say the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? That's a clear statement that we're not to fear. But then there's another passage, 1 Peter 1.17. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your stay upon the earth. So which is it? Not to fear or to fear? Well, the answer is biblically, it's both. But we have to understand the difference in the words that are represented by fear. Fear fits into three different categories. There's natural fear. This is not sinful. <laughs> I have one of those. 
I'm uh, afraid of heights. Well, I don't think that's really a, a bad thing. Um, we visited the Grand Canyon some years ago, and my fear of heights kept me from the edge of the canyon, where I read about some people go and accidentally slip and fall into the canyon to their death. Being afraid of heights is not a sin. It's just a natural fear that I have. I, I remember years ago, between a transition of churches, I was a laborer, a mason tender, for a, a brick and block layer down in Philadelphia. And we were working on a three or four story building, putting a cap around the edge. And my job was to mix the mud and supply the block and the brick to the guy that I was working for. And there was another tender who took care of the other guy. Well, in the process, we had to build a scaffold about three stories high, I guess it was. And uh, we had a pulley and a rope and all of that stuff. And my job, picture this now, I'm scared of heights, is to get off of that wall, step out on that scaffold, reach out and get the rope, and pull up the bricks and the buckets of concrete so that my guy can put block around the edge. Took me days to get over that, but these guys were old hardcore guys, and they looked at this young punk, and there was no sympathy for me. Get out there and do it. We're paying you by the hour. Well, was I sinful in my fear of heights? No. It's just a natural fear that gives us some wisdom. Don't go to dangerous places. It's that same kind of fear that uh, helps you get out of a burning building when you need it. It's the same kind of fear that helps you avoid those tough spots that are going to have devastating consequences in your life. So the first thing that we know in the scripture is there is a natural fear, a fear that is not sinful and we don't control everything and that is a clear reminder of that. It reminds us that we're human, reminds us that we are absolutely dependent on a sovereign God. It reminds us that we are weak and he is strong, that we are frail and he is mighty. It reminds us that we read about in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 that we are on a journey that is a downward slide into ultimate destruction and ruin of this body and transformation into an eternity to come. Fear has a good purpose. It keeps us safe and prevents chaos in the world. There's a story very clearly spelled out in Acts chapter 5 about Ananias and Sapphira. And uh, Ananias and Sapphira uh, seem to uh, be well respected in their church congregation and they own some property. They sold the property and they pretended that all of the proceeds from the property they were giving to God's work. Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit and he dropped dead. Sapphira came in not knowing her husband had died. And the men who had carried him out were waiting at the door to carry her out. She lies, she dies. What do you think the response of the congregation was in that situation? It was a very, very natural response of fear. Listen to these words in verse 11 of Acts chapter 5. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. You think God's messing around? Not the mighty God of this universe. Not Lord Sabaoth. Not Adonai. Not Jehovah. God's not messing around with his church and with his people and with his creation. 
But then there's another kind of fear, and that's a sinful fear. In Proverbs 29, 25, we read that the fear of man brings a snare. The fear of man, fearing what other people think about us, fearing what other people are going to say about us, fearing that if I witness to this person, they may never like me again, fear of offending a member of your family or a co-worker, and then being put on a course and a path of loneliness because nobody wants to talk to you. Fear of making the right decision because your friends and family are thinking you're some kind of weird. And we could go on and on and on with those kinds of illustrations of the fear of man. It brings a snare. It brings a trap. It keeps us from doing the things we should be doing. It keeps us from worshiping the God that we should worship in the way that we should worship. It keeps us from obeying God the way we are to obey him. 1 Peter 3.14, do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Matthew 10.28, do not fear those who can kill the body, but the one who can kill both body and soul. Beloved, eternity is not a thing to be messed with. We think life is long here. And it may be for some of us in a relative way. But when you compare the span of your life here, maybe you'll make it to your 70s, 80s, 90s. Some people break the 100 barrier, but then eternity comes. And eternity isn't measured by 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 100s. Eternity is mentioned as a time with no end. And depending on what you do with Jesus Christ in this life, believing that he is Lord and Savior and died on the cross as your substitute for your sin, if you reject that, you will go into an eternity that lasts forever and you'll never hear about him or see him again. No chance. And your puny 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years here is like the point of a pin on a timeline of eternity. Biblical courage is not the absence of natural fear. It's the absence of sinful fear. What made those three men walk into that fiery furnace, believing and trusting God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What caused Daniel to stand firm in his faith? What caused the apostle Paul, when he walked into a city, to know that he was going to end up in jail? What caused the Apostle Paul to have the strength and courage that he knew at some point he was going to lose his head for the gospel of Jesus? What has caused countless Christians through the years to be martyred for their faith and to stand strong and to say, I will not renounce my Savior and my Lord, and they are put to death? What would allow a man to be in the Colosseum and look down the jaws of animals and lions coming at him and not flinch and recant his faith? It's the kind of courage that comes because there's a fear of God in that person's heart. When does fear become sinful? Fear becomes sinful when it keeps us from obeying God's commands. I already touched on that a little bit in regard to Timothy. Timothy was given a gift. He was to exercise it on behalf of God and to glorify God. And he was reluctant and fearful to do that. But there's another good example in the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 24 through 26, a man gives 10, 5, and 
or uh, five, two, and one talent to his uh, workers. And he says, I want you to use this and uh, gain something for me. Well, the first man who got five brings ten. The second man doubled his two. And the third man buried his. And when it was time for the accounting, he brought one. What was his response? He said, I know you're a hard man. I know you're a man who uh, reaps where he does not sow. I know all of that, and I was afraid. And so I buried the talent. He knew what he should do, but he had a fear of man issue that now turned into a sinful fear because he was a bad steward. And because of that, the talent was taken from him and given to the man who brought ten. You see, fear is sinful when it causes us to disobey the commands of God. I mentioned Isaac before. He's with Rebecca. Rebecca is a beautiful woman. And Isaac is afraid that the men of the place that he is at are going to fall in love with Rebecca because she is beautiful. And he's afraid for his life because he sees the option to kill him so that they can marry her. So what does he do? He lies. He said, don't worry about uh, Rebecca. She's my sister. Well, that was all well and good until Isaac was seen by the king as not dealing with Rebecca as his sister. The Hebrew word really means that Isaac was Isaacing her. He was caressing her. He was treating her like he would not treat his sister. And he gets in trouble for that with the authorities. But he was just like a chip off the old block because Abraham had done the same thing about Sarah. What was the response of the people in authority? They said, why did you put us in jeopardy this way so that we might sin with your wife? You see, their fear of man, their fear caused them to disobey God. What should they have done instead of lying? Tell the truth. That's clearly spelled out in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, in the great chapter of putting off and putting on. If you're a liar, put off lies and begin to tell the truth. If you're a thief, put off stealing and go get a job. There's a principle that we are to put off sinful behavior and replace it with godly behavior. So both Abraham and Isaac found themselves trapped in a situation, and they lied to get out of it. When you're afraid, ask yourself, if your fear is causing you to disobey God's commandments, when you're afraid, do you lie? Do you cheat? Do you steal? Do you yell at others? Do you fight with others? Do you abuse others? Do you exploit others? There's a long list of things that reveal what's going on down inside Ron Wolf's heart when bad behavior and sinful words and attitudes are reflected. And it's the same for you. Fear is also sinful when it causes us to think and act sinfully and unbiblically. I'd like you to turn over to Philippians chapter 4. This is a great passage that uh, often I think gets overlooked in its importance. Because we are reminded in the scripture, are we not, to renew our minds. Well, how do we renew our minds? We renew them from the futility of their darkness and their brokenness by filling them with God's truth. In Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 6, 
This is in the context of anxiety and fear. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, get that, the peace of God that surpasses any other peace you can ever imagine. You can't even comprehend the peace that you have with God. And one of the reasons is it was based on an act of incomprehensible, incomparable sacrifice and love of sending Jesus to the cross. It shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 8. Finally, brother, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. One of the things you need to do when you're finding yourself fearful is ask yourself, where is my mind going? Am I thinking about the what ifs? What if I get in my car and I drive down the street and somebody goes through a red light and hits me and I die? That's a what if. It's not based in fact, it's a possibility, but it hasn't happened yet and you have no guarantee that it will. And that's true of so many of us that we let our minds drift into the what if, what if, what if category. And we stop dwelling on the things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, and excellence, and anything worthy of praise. You see, what God is telling you to do is take those thoughts captive that are bringing fear and anxiety into your heart and get out of the what-if category over into the categories that God wants us to dwell on because that reinforces our knowledge and awareness of God and it reinforces the application of those into the life situations. Because remember, it gets back to we believe God is always present in every circumstance. Sinful fear comes from not trusting God. Do we believe Romans 8, 28 or not? We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called in according to his purpose. We get in trouble with that verse when we leave off the second half or we distort the second half and think that God should be concerned more about our purposes rather than his own. And you see, we're then moving him off of the throne where he is absolutely in control and sovereign over all things and we're putting our agenda out and then we're mad at God because he doesn't fulfill our agenda. But we have to get back to the first part of the verse, that he causes all things to work together for good. Does it get back to Psalm 23 again? That even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil? Well, how can that be good? It's very good because God's moving you from this broken, feudal environment in which you live into an eternal glory in his presence in which the suffering of the present time can't be compared to what's to come. I'd say that's pretty good. There's very few days that I don't say in one form or another, Lord Jesus, come quickly, because I look out on the horizon and I don't see much that's to get excited about down here when I understand what's ahead in eternity. And that's the mindset we need to develop. And then we'll understand Romans 8.28 and apply it much better to our lives. Romans chapter 5, 3 through 5. 
we exalt in our tribulations. I don't always do that. Maybe you do. If you do, tell me how. I don't always exalt in my tribulations, but we should, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, proven character, hope, and hope that does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. And the scripture tells us in 1 John 4, 18, that perfect love casts out fear. Now, let me caution you. You look at me today and you say, I love God. I know he loves me, but it, it's not that I'm fearless at this point. It's a process, beloved. It's a process. It's a process that happens over the course of years where we are getting to know God better, where we are trusting God more when we are believing in his promises. And you know why most of us don't believe in a lot of his promises is because we don't know them. Let me ask you, how much do you know about your God? A lot of the difficulty that we have in our lives is because we're ignorant about the one we say we worship. We don't interact with the scriptures like we should. We don't apply the scriptures as we should. If you have never read the book by J.I. Packer, Knowing God, you have cheated yourself. Now, Knowing God is not the Bible, but the book Knowing God by J.I. Packer is a relatively concise treatment of the great attributes of God where Packer has brought from all of Scripture and consolidated them into these topics so that we can know God more and we can know him better and we can know him experientially by putting great theology into shoe-level living. But much of our fear comes because we don't know and we don't trust our magnificent God. So there's natural fear that is not sinful. I have some of those, you have some of those. And that's okay. It probably keeps us from hurting ourselves and bringing chaos into our lives. But then there's sinful fear, which all of us fall into from time to time because we don't do what we should and sometimes we do what we shouldn't. And I'll tell you one area where we fall short all the time is loving God every moment of every day with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. We just don't. But then there's a holy fear. That is a fear that we ought to seek. John Flavel says natural fear is a normal passion of the soul to avoid danger and catastrophe. Sinful fear is the normal passion of the soul that's corrupted. And holy fear is the normal passion of the soul sanctified and put to holy use. 1 Peter 1.17 says if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay holy fear what does holy fear lead to it leads to knowledge and wisdom it keeps us from sin it produces in us joy and contentment Think back over this last week. How many times in the course of the seven days have you really found yourself content and filled with joy? Or are you consumed more with the worries and the passions of this world and they've distracted you away from what we were singing in that last song before the message, beautiful words, that God is absolutely, totally in control. What is God's way of dealing with our fears? That was a really long introduction because here we go to the meat passage.
What is God's way of dealing with our fears? It's summarized in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 11 through 14. The context is very clear. You have to go back to chapter 7. You have to go back to 1 Chronicles and 2 Kings. And we can't go into all the intricate details of what's happening to Judah and Israel, the tribes, other than to say that there are enemies that are alliancing against them to destroy them. And Isaiah is called upon to be the guy to stand up and tell Judah that they're going to be destroyed. How would you like to have that mission as your mission statement? Isaiah is a man like us. Isaiah is a man who can have fears just like us. Remember back in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah had some experiences that you and I are waiting for in eternity. He was taken into the throne room of God and he saw the might and the majesty and the power of God and he was undone. But God purified his lips and raised him up to be one of his spokesmen. And he had a message to bring to Judah that was very difficult for them to hear. Judah, you're going to be destroyed, you're going to be impoverished, and you're going to be desolate. So the reaction of the people is, <laughs> you're part of a conspiracy, Isaiah. You're part of an alliance with these Assyrians and... Uh, He's not. He's just a spokesman for God, warning them that the judgment of God is going to fall. Now remember, the judgment of God is going to fall on his chosen people, but it's because of their disobedience and their falling in love with other gods and their hearts drifting away from the God of the universe and the God who chose them to be the messengers of the good news. So his plan is summarized in verses 11 through 14. For the Lord spoke to me with mighty power. Notice that. Mighty power. And he instructed me not to walk in the way of this people. In other words, he's saying to Isaiah in very strong language, I want you to see how my people are reacting. And I don't want you to behave like them. You are not to say it is a conspiracy. In other words, don't join in on this conversation and think that there's some alliance here. Ahaz had made an alliance with Assyria and he thought that was going to save his nation and save his neck, and it wasn't because Assyria was going to sweep in and take them out. In regard to all that this people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Then he will become a sanctuary. But to both the houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So here it is. Here's God's game plan for how you deal with your fears. Stand on the truths that you know are realities that come out of the word of God. What are some of those? God's all-powerful. There's nothing that compares to God in power. He can crush all things or anything, anytime he wants. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. He knows all of your thoughts, all of your words, before they ever enter your mind or come out of your mouth. And he's not surprised by what happens on the evening or the morning news. 
He already knows the end from the beginning. He already has a timetable worked out. There's already a day fixed. There's already a day of your death that's been determined. And after we die, we are going to stand before God in judgment. Don't worry about how you answer the questions that your peers ask. The only fear we ought to have is how are we going to answer the question when we stand before God about what we have done with Jesus. And really, you better answer that question before that time comes. Do not compromise, Isaiah. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Don't look to man for your solutions. Don't look to the government for your solutions. My, how we've fallen into that. I don't want to get into that in detail, but we are looking at uh, a lot of things for solutions and ways to deal with life that are not bringing God into the equation. Jeremiah 17.5, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. Isaiah, tell the people what's going to happen. (laughs) An evil nation is going to come and destroy you. But verse 12, in regard to all this, and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. In other words, Isaiah, stay calm. Are you staying calm? When the world around us seems to be in chaos and we're seeing things that we have never seen before in the course of our lifetime. We should as God's people because it reflects who we're trusting in. We're not trusting in the science. We're not trusting in the politics. We're not trusting in the human solutions. They can be a part of it if God so chooses to use them as a solution to the problem. But the ultimate person that is in charge of all of it is no other than God himself. And then he tells us in verse 13, this is the key to it all. Be godly. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. What's this mean? To make God holy. Well, God's intrinsically holy. In his very nature. He's perfect in every way. You're not making God holy. What it means is to reckon and believe and apply that you have been redeemed and you are worshiping and serving an absolute perfect and holy God. In other words, make God where he deserves to be. He is holy other. He is supreme over all things. And he is the creator. And we are part of the creation. We are the clay and we do not tell the potter what to do. We simply carry out what the potter makes us to do. To sanctify something means it is to place him in the absolute unique position in your heart and in your life. I think it's Wayne Mack says that God is not banana split awesome. God is earthquake awesome. There's a big difference between those two things. John Flavel said, our fears come from ignorance, ignorance of God, ignorance of men. 
We are to remember God's power, his glory, and his faithfulness. After all, didn't we see in Psalm 46, Lord Sabaoth, he's Lord of the armies, he's Lord of all. Do we believe that? Do we live in that awareness? Do we live in that knowledge? Assyria was just a tool in God's hand. Amos 9 says, The Lord God of hosts, the one who touches the land so it melts, and all those who dwell in it mourn, the one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has founded his vaulted dome over the earth, he who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. So we need to fear God. Natural fears are okay. Sinful fears are terrible things and we need to correct them. But we need to fear a holy God. And that does not mean to live in constant terror of a holy God. It means to put him in the place that he belongs. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Are you frightened or overwhelmed with fear? Psalm 91 says, he, dwell, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress in the God in whom I trust. Where are you today with your fears? We're told to run to God. He is our refuge and strength in present times of trouble. And Isaiah chapter 8 tells us that. Sanctify him in our hearts. Recognize who he is and give him that rightful place. And then we are to stay calm. We are to stay based on our convictions. And we are to have a holy fear and a reverence. Fall on our knees and worship him. I trust that in these tumultuous times that the scripture has reminded us sufficiently of the greatness and the glory of our God, our God alone. Father, come into your presence thankful. Come into your presence joyful. Because you have accomplished on our behalf what we never could have done on our own. You have sent a Savior who loved us, who died for us, who was raised from the dead for us, and has promised to come again for us. In the meantime, in these days of uncertainty and trouble and the occasions of fear, may we lift our eyes to the one who alone is almighty, and that is you. May we praise you. May we draw our comfort from you. May we find joy and peace in the relationship we have with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.